Welcome to Unpacking the Mass with Keith Nestor. On this podcast, we dig into the week's readings for the upcoming Sunday for the Catholic Church so that when you go to Mass, you are ready to hear what God has to say to you through the Scriptures. So grab your Bibles and let's get digging. Hello, friends. Welcome to Unpacking the Mass. Today, we're looking at the readings for the 15th Sunday in Ordinary Time. So thankful that you have joined me here today. Remember, the purpose of Unpacking the Mass is to help us prepare ourselves for the upcoming week's readings. So it's very important that you watch this ahead of time. Now, I know some of you probably watch it again at the end. Uh, That's cool, too. But I think that if we go into Mass having an understanding of the readings, fully grasping what the Lord's trying to say to us as best we can. When you walk out of Mass, you are going to feel so filled with truth. It's going to be amazing. That's important, obviously. And today's readings, we're going to be dealing with the issue of who do you work for? Who do you work for? This was something that I wrestled with sometimes when I found myself in churches when I was a a Protestant uh, working in ministry, because sometimes people would say say things to me like, well, listen, you need to remember, Keith, you work for us, so you better do what we want. Now, thankfully, not that many people approached me that way, but there were people that chose to do that. And I want to share with you in a few minutes how I responded to that. Maybe it was the right way. Maybe it was the wrong way. I don't know. We'll see. But we're going to look at All of these things. First, we're going to pray, though, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your readings. We thank you for your church. We thank you for your word. And we ask that as we open them up and dig into them, that they would dig into us. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, our first reading gets right into it from the book of Amos. How many of you have read the book of Amos lately? Starting at verse 12 of chapter 7. Now, we're going to back up after I read these readings. We need a little context here, which as we do sometimes. So let's take a look at what this reading says. And Amaziah said to Amos. Now, I could be butchering that name. Amaziah, Amaziah, I don't know. We're going to go with Amaziah. All right, let's check that out. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Okay, now at first glance, we're like, what does this mean? You got this one guy saying to Amos, Go over there and prophesy over there, but don't come over here. We don't want to hear what you have to say. And Amos is saying, look, this wasn't what I wanted to do in the first place. I'm a herdsman. The Lord is the one who came to me and said, here's where I want you to go. But let's look up back a couple of verses to see the context. I'm going to start in verse 10 here. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, okay, so now we know who he is, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos had said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. Then right after our readings in verse 15, we read this. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, Thus says the Lord. You know there's something heavy coming when you see, therefore, thus says the Lord. Okay, here we go. Your wife shall be a harlot in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. Boom. Okay, so what is going on here? Well, clearly Jeroboam, this, this wicked king of Israel, he's he doesn't want to hear from the true prophet of God. So this Amaziah comes to, to, to Jeroboam and says, don't listen to this guy. All right? We don't want to hear from him. So then he goes to Amos and says, basically, keep away. Keep away. We don't want to hear your words. Okay, we're rejecting the word of God. So what does what does Amos do? Boom, he drops this bomb on him here and says, "Look, you're going to die, dude, and your kids are going to die. Your wife's going to be a harlot and Israel's going to be exiled 
because it didn't matter who this guy Jeroboam was in terms of his statute as a king. What mattered was, was he rebellious toward God? And so God sends his prophet Amos to basically lay the smack down. I think this helps a little bit more when you hear the greater context of these verses. And sometimes we need to do that. Somebody asked me recently, I don't understand why on some of the things that the church gives us, it doesn't seem to quite give us the whole deal. You know, I'm not here to speak to that. The church gives us what the church wants to give us on Sunday mornings, but that doesn't mean that we can only read that. It doesn't mean that we can't go, hmm, this is a little confusing. And I think that's a great principle to live your life by when you're reading the texts, when you're looking at the scriptures. If you come up against something that doesn't seem to quite make sense, then read before, read after. That's the idea. Be drawn into it, my friends. And when you do that, sometimes things make a little more sense. But keep in mind what we just heard from um, Amos here as we move forward. Okay, let's look at our responsorial psalm from Psalm 85. Lord, let us see your kindness and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Lord, let us see your kindness and grant us your salvation. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. Lord, let us see your kindness and grant us your salvation. Yea, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Lord, let us see your kindness and grant us your salvation. Our second reading comes to us from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. For he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. We who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Wow. Boom. Okay, a couple things here. This is talking really about God's predestined plan to make his will done in the world. Now, notice what it says about that. And I know some people get uncomfortable when we start talking about predestination, which you shouldn't get uncomfortable about that. You should recognize God's sovereignty. But you should also understand that God has worked into his predestined will, our free will. And whether we choose to be a part of his predestined plan, that's ultimately something that we must work out with God. But what is his plan? And what is he wanting to do? He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's got this incredible inheritance that is set aside for us. We've been sealed in this, but notice it says, once we have acquired it, it's waiting for us. It's waiting for us in heaven. Now, some people use this to talk about, well, once saved, always saved. But that's not the focus of this text. The focus of this text is not whether or not you can choose to walk away from it or not. The focus of the text is the it that we're talking about. What is it that we can or can't walk away from? Which I'm going to argue, and the church argues, and everyone argued for 1,500 plus years, that you can walk away from that. But that has nothing to do with how great the gift is, with how great the inheritance is. You can have an inheritance 
of $5 billion left to you, but you can choose to not receive it. You can walk away from it or you can receive it and then you can choose to give it away. Now, can you do this in heaven? No, but he says once you've actually fully acquired it. So there's this sense of of recognizing that you've been set aside for God's plan and God's will, but you haven't fully acquired it until you've stepped in to, to heaven at the end of your life, if you've been faithful, if you have persevered, my friends. But you have to remember, and this is the point of all this, this is God's doing. This is what he has chosen to do. It's predestined to happen. He's appointed you to live for the praise of his glory. In him you also who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, okay? When that happens, you're sealed. We believe this happens at baptism with the Holy Spirit. That's what happens to you. You're sealed with that. And that's something that you need to think about. Now, you say, well, Keith, it would make me happy if I knew that God predestined this to happen and there was nothing I could do about it. Here's what I want to say about that. I think that there's an element of of this that can be a great comfort to us when we look at ourselves and we feel like, man, God can't possibly love me. I'm not good enough. I have a past, whatever it might be. When you read texts like this, you should be encouraged to know that God wasn't looking at you going, boy, I sure hope you can figure out your salvation. No, friends, that is his will being done. Your job is to receive it. Your job is to cooperate with it and to put your faith in in Christ and to be obedient to what he's calling you to do. But, and let's be real here, your part is nothing compared to his part. Our, what we do is, is very passive compared to what he has done. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we don't have to be obedient and work with that grace. He's given us free will. But understand this, your free will is ultimately a choice that you make to receive what God is doing to you and in you. It's more of a a reception than trying to navigate through all of this, what we're referred to oftentimes as Catholics, as trying to work out your salvation. Now, St. Paul does say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We got to remember that part too. But it's not up to you to invent it. It's not up to you to merit it, to deserve it. Christ has given that to you. But what it looks like for you to work it out is obedience and faithfulness. But remember, and this is where this fits in with these readings, God chose you for this. You didn't choose yourself. And the reality is, apart from his grace, you didn't choose him either. The catechism tells us that even the ability to choose God is a gift of grace from God. You don't just wake up one day and in your sinful state, go, I think I'll choose God. No, if you've been baptized, then in your baptism, you were given the grace needed to do that. And if you haven't been baptized, maybe the Lord is opening your eyes to the fact, hey, I need to be baptized. What do I do now? That's a grace too. Get baptized, receive that, my friends, and then live in it. Why? To the praise of his glory, which is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. I love that. That's sometimes a verse we don't really hear about a lot. But we have to remember what he's kept for us in heaven, my friends. May we all acquire that together. Okay, let's look at our gospel here from Mark 6, 7 through 13. And he called to him the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put in two tunics. And he said to them, where you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. And if any place will not receive you and they refuse to hear you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet for a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Now, of course, this is the mission that God sends out his disciples to fulfill. And I've said this before, but I'll keep saying it again. He didn't say to them, all right, you guys, get together, figure out what you want to do and go do it. No, he gave them the mission. Remember, Jesus is the one who chooses the disciples, right? And what does he say? And one of you is a devil. Sometimes 
We look at God's choices and we go, I don't get it, but he has a plan. God chose us, my friends. And when he does it, here's the deal. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. People looked at the disciples and they said, who are these guys? Why do they get to say these things? Where do they get such authority? Their authority didn't come from other humans. It came from Jesus. He chose them for this. And now what was their message? This is important. Hey, everybody, it's cool. You, uh, you're you okay. I'm okay. Everything's great. No, repent. That was the message that he said. And they healed people. They cast out demons. But what's important is this. Their message inherently was a challenging message that many people were going to reject. So he gives them instructions on how to handle people that accept them and on how to handle people that reject them. Pay attention to those instructions, my friends, because these are principles that we can apply to our lives. Now, what are those principles? If someone accepts you, then remain with them. If someone rejects you, then shake the dust off your feet and leave. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. This doesn't mean you can leave your wife. This doesn't mean you can leave your husband. St. Paul gives us other instructions about that later in the New Testament that talk about that, about why if an unbelieving spouse is willing to stay with the believing spouse, the believing spouse doesn't have cause to divorce them. You don't do that, okay? However, in the context of preaching the gospel and your mission, there will be people that will reject you. And what is your responsibility supposed to be to those people? To beg and plead and and argue and fight and fuss? Now, of course not. Now, what I mean is this. There's different levels of this in in relationships. This doesn't mean that if you encounter someone and they don't accept everything you say the first time you say it, you're just supposed to be done with them, okay? Because the fact that they want to interact with you and talk with you at some level, is an acceptance of your message. doesn't mean they agree with it, but they're willing to at least accept that this is your position and and they're willing to engage with you. If people are willing to engage with you and they want to discuss the faith with you, by all means, you should stay there and have that conversation. Jesus wasn't telling the disciples that everyone who didn't immediately, at this first word that they spoke, fall on their face and repent, that they should leave them. No, sometimes that has to develop. It has to grow. But if ultimately they're like, nope, we're not listening to you. We, re- we reject you and we don't want anything that you say to enter into our ears, then it's time to move on because we got a mission to do. There are going to be people in your lives, my friends, that you may feel like they're rejecting the message, but maybe they just need to let it ruminate a little bit more. Maybe it just needs to sink in a little bit deeper. And if they're willing to hear you out, and have conversations with you, then you should do that. But if they're just like, nope, I'm only going to completely turn you off and reject you completely, then you're not obligated to keep beating your head against the wall with that person. Maybe God has someone else later that he wants to bring that uh, to a better place with them. So keep that in mind when you are going out and fulfilling Christ's mission. It's not a mission that's easily accepted. So if it were, then we wouldn't even worry about people repenting because they would all be like, oh yeah, no problem. That's great. It's important because too many people in the world today want to soften this message. They want to soften what Christ has come to say so that the world will receive it. Now, can you think of anything more ridiculous? If And I I remember feeling this way oftentimes when I would see in my former denomination this, this pattern of watering things down and, and, and sometimes the justification to complete disobedience of what the church teaches and what the scripture teaches, okay? Because remember, before I was a Catholic, I was a Protestant. Nobody cared what the church taught, but they were supposed to care what the Bible taught. And they would say things like, oh, well, if we preach that message, nobody's going to want to come here. If we preach that message, we're going to turn a bunch of people off. It got so bad, not in my denomination, but in others that I've seen, that there were churches, especially in the 80s, when the whole seeker movement was becoming a thing. Some of you were there. Where churches went to great lengths to remove anything from even their gathering space that looked too churchy, like a cross. Now, I know you're not going to see a crucifix in most Protestant churches, but they were even going so far as to remove a cross. I remember reading books about this. This stuff didn't just happen by accident. It was intentional because what they wanted to do was basically pull some kind of bait and switch on people. And what it looked like was this. 
And you, you can still see it today. We're going to preach a message of encouragement, of, of, of positivity, of, of things that are going to draw people in. We're not going to, to convict anyone or judge anyone or, or cause anyone to be scandalized. No, we're not going to say anything that's going to be hard to hear. We're going to preach a message of openness and love and joy and, you know, like I said, encouragement. And, and people will then want to be drawn in to this message and, and we don't want to do anything to offend them. And they might have some baggage from their life growing up in Christianity because they're probably raised Catholic and they saw all this, this, you know, scary religious churchy stuff. And we want to make sure we put out a different message with that. So get rid of the cross, get rid of stained glass windows, get rid of certain things we're going to say in the worship service. The songs that we sing can't sound too churchy. So let's just play some secular music from the radio. That'll draw them in. And let's not tell them that they need to change their lives. Let's just tell them that they're okay the way they are. And God loves you just as you are. And we welcome all and celebrate all. You've seen this. Friends, when you see that, you know that you're not seeing the gospel. Because the message of the gospel is a message ultimately of repentance. It's a message that's going to say to you, yes, you are loved, but you're loved so much that God's not going to leave you the way you are. He's calling you to change. He's calling you to repentance. And he's going to give you the grace that you need in order to do that. That's a different message. But this world is so messed up and churches have so messed up everything that anyone who comes with that message, whether you're Catholic or Protestant, you're often rejected as, well, you're some kind of wacko fundamentalist. Friends, we've got to be careful of that. The world's going to reject you. The world rejected Amos the prophet. And that was sort of, you could say, in some senses, the church. I know it wasn't technically the church, but the people of God, the kingdom of Israel. And they were like, we don't want to hear that. Get rid of this guy. But you know what Amos said, basically? And this kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning of my, of my episode here. When people didn't like what I used to say, and they would come to me and say, remember, Keith, you work for us. I would say this to them. I don't work for you. I work for God. What? What are you talking about? That's right. I don't work for you. I work for God. A prophet doesn't work for other people. Friends, when we're called, and I'm not saying that I'm a prophet, but in reality, maybe you could say in a, in a small p sense of that word, we're all, as believers, prophets of God. We're all here to bring the message of the gospel to the world, to show people what holiness looks like, to show people who God is. And guess what? Sometimes the world isn't going to approve of that. And if you and I and everyone else is so worried about what the world says about us, then we're never going to make it. Jesus sent out his apostles. He chose them for his mission. And yes, there would be people that would reject it. Now, you got to remember, since God is the one who chose you, it doesn't matter what anyone else says. And this is easy to say, but it's hard to put it into practice, isn't it? Because we often evaluate our effectiveness in in ministry and life and trying to show other people the faith, we have, we evaluate that based on how other people respond. And of course, this is something that we have to remind ourselves all the time. We don't work for you. We work for him. People need to hear this. People on YouTube need to hear this. Oftentimes, people run the, the message that they have for their online ministry through the filter of, is this going to get a lot of views? Well, let me ask you a question. What's more important, that you get a lot of views or that thus saith the Lord? Some people need to hear that. I need to hear that sometimes. Often, sometimes I'll be like, okay, I can't say that. It's not going to get a lot of views. It doesn't matter. I've given up, by the way, on, on the whole views thing. Um, and, and it is what it is. I'm going to preach the truth and I'm going to say what I feel God's called me to say. And whether 500,000 people watch it or 500 people watch it, ultimately, I don't work for YouTube. I work for Jesus. I work for God. God sends his prophets to speak for him. So if we hear someone who speaks for him, we need to listen. That's the other thing. I'm kind of approaching this from the one who's doing the speaking. But we also recognize, and I need to recognize, we need to be good listeners too, don't we? Where have we said to someone who's come to us with thus saith the Lord and said, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. 
And we're going to get into who that is in a minute because a lot of people say, well, that's me. And I'm telling you, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Just kidding. But sometimes people will say things, you know, to us, to all of us. They'll say, hey, I really think you ought to do it this way. I really think you do it that way. And even in the Catholic world, I've noticed this. Some people are coming, they'll come at you with like, well, I had a dream or I had a vision or God spoke to me or this saint said this. So you better do what I have to say. Friends, thus saith the Lord. We got to be careful that it ain't thus saith us. All right. Because God's authority is connected to God's mission, which he has destined to be fulfilled. And the question that we have to ask when we're speaking and when we're listening is whose mission is at play here? When I'm coming to you, am I trying to get you to do my will or am I trying to get you to do God's will? It's okay if there are times when I want to get you to do my will, but I just make sure that there's a disclaimer there, right? Now, I would say I really would love, it'd be my will if you'd subscribe to this channel and share this video. Is that God's will? I don't know. I'm not going to say that it is. But we can, we can certainly say, hey, this is something I think or something I try. I want to try this or do that. Or, it, you know, when you're talking to someone, it's okay if you have an opinion or if you have something that makes sense to you to say, hey, have you thought about this? Let me give you a suggestion or whatever. But when we pull out the, well, God told me you're supposed to do this. We got to be careful, my friends. We got to be careful because we have a mechanism in play. Jesus gave it to us for us to know the difference and for us to, to weigh these things against, what is that mechanism? We kind of saw it in Jesus' words here, right? The apostles were sent out with his mission. And another thing that Jesus told them is this, he who hears you hears me. So God has given his church the authority to say, thus saith the Lord. That's what we need to measure everything against, my friends. We need to measure Whatever someone comes to us with, with, does it go along with what God has revealed to us in his word, the written word of the scripture and the magisterium and teaching of authority of his church, right? That goes together. And I, I know some people are always wanting to separate those two things and be like, well, is it the Bible or is it the magisterium? I don't think we're supposed to um, separate those two things. I know they're not the same thing, but they flow from the same source, as Vatican II tells us. The, the word of God flows from the same authority as the magisterium of the church, friends. They receive their authority from Jesus. So God's word given to us in the Holy Scriptures and through the teaching authority of the magisterium, that's how we know, thus saith the Lord. So the filter that I, that I use when someone comes to me with, hey, you need to do this or you need to do that, or the filter that I want to use when I say to someone, you need to do this, you need to do that, is what does the church teach? Because the church is the ministry of the apostles sent out on God's mission with God's authority. Think about that for a second. What do you do when you run up against that? Do you resist it or do you receive it? Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? That's why when people ask me questions, I had somebody ask me a question the other day about something related to um, culpability in with regard to mortal sin. And what if someone didn't know that was a mortal sin, but they just did? The, how does all that play out? And it was something that was really detailed and a nuanced question. And obviously in a YouTube comment thread, I can't completely pull that apart and, and speak to all of that. So I just basically said, you know, what, whatever the church says is right. So look deeper into church documents and into what the church teaches about that rather than seeking my opinion. Because my opinion at the end of the day doesn't mean a whole lot. What matters is what is spoken by the church. Because here's the thing, our mission is connected to that authority. When we are on God's mission, we need to trust God. And this is where the whole don't bring the sandals, don't do all this, the, don't take all this stuff with people sometimes freak out and they go, wait a minute, is this about poverty? Well, I don't think so. I mean, maybe, but I think what it's more about is this. Trusting that when God guides you and God sends you on his mission, he's going to give you what you need to fulfill it. Do you trust him? That's the issue, isn't it? What do you really need to accomplish his mission? If you're on his mission, you'll have it. And I think sometimes we can get Stuck in thinking, well, I need this. I need more money. I need more stuff. I know I do that a lot. <laughs> the reality is, I don't. I have what I need. And if I 
And if I needed more stuff, God would bring it to me. And I thank God when he does. And it's been amazing how I've seen that play out. There have been plenty of times where, where I've thought to myself, man, this would make things a lot easier to do this or, or whatever. And sometimes the Lord doesn't bring that to me. Sometimes he does. And it's pretty cool when, it, when it's happened. I've been praying about whether the Lord would provide to me a bigger studio to do videos. Now you might say, what's wrong with this one? This is great for unpacking the mass and other videos, but when I'm doing my, my in-person interviews, which you're seeing some of those drop now and you'll see more coming, sometimes I feel like it'd be a lot nicer to have a, a bigger building with a big studio and all that kind of stuff. So I just throw that out to people and say, hey, if anybody's got a space, but I haven't heard anything yet that's really gonna work. And you know what the reality is? I did one the other night in this space and it came out great. So maybe the Lord's just saying, Keith, you're, you're fine. You have what you need. And I can accept that. And I believe with all my heart that whatever I do need, God will provide. And it's not just about stuff like this. This goes to our everyday lives, my friends. This goes to the, the mission that he's called each of us to be on when it comes to other people. And here's where this really hit me recently. I got to do a debate a couple of weeks ago in, in Colorado Springs at an event. Some of you watching this might have been there. Uh, and it was a debate against a uh, Protestant man who's a, a he's a Moody Bible Institute grad and nice guy, uh, trained to be a pastor, and uh, certainly a, a wonderful guy and and Christian man. And the debate was going to be on authority. And when they told me I was doing this debate, I was a little freaked out. Not because I'm afraid to do debates. I pl- I do that plenty of times with people, but I, I have other reasons why that is a little bit um, sensitive for me. And I was thinking to myself, okay, I got to be ready for this. So I spent a couple of days just literally working through stuff, trying to get as prepared as I needed to be. I I read like the entire, not the entire, I almost said the entire first half, but that doesn't make sense. I read the first half of St. Francis de Sales, The Catholic Controversies, because that's an incredible defense of our Catholic faith. I would have read the whole thing, but I ran out of time. And I studied a bunch of stuff. I talked to a couple other apologists that I respected about different things. And I created these documents and I had these notes and all of this stuff. I was like, okay, boom, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be prepared. And I was really worked up about it. And when I got to the debate, it was my time to give my presentation. The Lord revealed to me, you know what? You're good. The things that I want to speak through you aren't things that you're going to pull up a presentation and work through line by line. I mean, I did some of that. But 90% of the stuff that I needed to say in those, in those moments and, and be ready for weren't things that I had. <laughs> but I had what I needed. Now, did it go perfectly? Probably not. But at the end of the day, I feel like I, I, I said what the Lord wanted me to say. Did everybody in the room instantly become Catholic? No. As a matter of fact, I had some pretty, pretty um, I don't want to say heated, but pretty intense conversations afterwards with some Protestant guys who were just like, you know, not receiving what I was saying, but we had a really good dialogue and I thought it was great. So the the point of the story is this. Sometimes it isn't about all of these things that we think we needed. The, the disciples, you could say, well, do you need a, an extra tunic? Did you need this? Did you need sandals? Or what, you know, all the things. I don't remember everything that they said in there. And you might think, well, they probably did. The reality is they had exactly what they needed and more. And what was that? They had the right message and they had the mandate from Jesus. They had his mission, which gave them his authority. And friends, when we carry that same mission into the world, then we do as well. Now, I don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you or I have the authority of an apostle, but what I'm saying is this, we have what they said and we have their teachings and we can say to people, this is what they said. And when you hear them, you hear him. So in as much as we can, can understand the teachings of the faith and the gospel and the church and all of this stuff, and we can bring that to people and draw them in, friends, we have that authority, not from a personal standpoint, but we have the access to it through the message of the gospel. And that's what we say. And that's why we reminded that in the end, we don't work for them. We work for him. Whatever you need for your mission, your personal mission in your life, he's going to bring it to you. People say sometimes, like, what video am I supposed to show people? What book can I give them? What can I? 
whatever you are going to need, God's going to make sure you have. Seek him for that. Be ready to be used by him for his mission. Because guess what, my friend? He's chosen you. Thanks so much for watching Unpacking the Mass this week. If it's been helpful to you, I pray that you'd share it with someone else and just maybe it'd be helpful for them as well. God bless you, my friends. Take care and we'll see you next week.